Hello and welcome back to our second session on Judaism. We left off at the time when Israel was settling the Promised Land in the books of Joshua and Judges and were defeating one king after the other, one town after the other, and began to settle. For this session, I will be uh, stopping to wander myself because the Israelites are stopping to wander. Just so I am arriving home and we'll just sit here a little bit and tell you the story from this beautiful position in the sun. This period becomes really important because of this doing this time that all those stories that we heard about in uh, the mythology and the legends from Abraham all the way down through the Exodus where they were written down. This is also the period in which we can begin to date things. We are now in the Iron Age and things become a little bit more historic. It is also the time when you have uh, the prophets, prophets like Isaiah and Micah and other prophets. It is also the period in which uh, the temples were built, two Jewish temples that were really important. It is the time when Jewish people were developing the practices of sacrificing in the temple. It is when Jewish people are starting to worship Yahweh as a more firm religion. See, it is the period when the idea of the Messiah comes about, and even the idea of the Son of God. And we will see the shift from henotheism to full monotheism within the Jewish religion. We are starting out with a debate within the Israelites that had now settled in all the different places in, in Israel, uh, whether or not those tribes should be governed by one king, or whether it was okay that the tribes are just loosely confederated and that occasionally they would raise up a leader when it was necessary to defeat an enemy. And there was more and more the idea that Israel should also have a king, just like the other nations around would have kings. Um, a king that would unite the whole kingdom. So we hear about the prophet Samuel. Samuel originally uh, was against the idea of a king because he thought that God is the king. God is leaving Israel, has led Israel through the desert all along and with the, uh, was present with the ark and has always given Israel victory. So why do they need a king? But the people are pushing the idea and so eventually Samuel proclaims to the people that God gave the okay for them to have a king. When you begin to read the book of Samuel, uh, you can see that there is a whole story about how this new king was selected. It was eventually King Saul who became the first king of Israel. The prophet Samuel took oil and poured the oil over the head of the new king. And there was a ceremony around that that recited what we have today in Psalm 2, where it says, where, where God says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. The idea was that the king of Israel was su supposed to represent God on earth, so that the people of Israel would be faithful to, to the God of Israel. And the pouring out of oil, the Hebrew word for that is Mashiach, meaning that the one who is anointed, who now becomes the adopted son of God, is the Messiah. But as the story goes, King Saul was not really doing what he was supposed to be doing, and so he lost favor from God's sight. Uh, Samuel the prophet goes out and finds another king. He goes to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, south of Jerusalem, in the family of Jesse. He's asking all of the uh, sons of Jesse to come forward because the king was supposed to come from his family. And after Samuel went through all of the older sons, finally uh, he comes to the last one, to the youngest one, to David. And he says, that's the one. He is going to be the king of Israel. And so he anoints him secretly. He becomes the secret Messiah, as long as Saul is still reigning. Stories about David were abounding. For example, the story of David and Goliath. Maybe some of you remember that story, where there was a giant strong soldier among the Philistines and everyone was afraid to, def to fight against Goliath. And Goliath challenged the Israelites to come out and have one person fight Goliath. Um, 
And then little David decided, yeah, I, I'll do this. I can do this. And everybody was kind of worried about little David. How does he know as a teenager? How can he fight this big soldier? And he took a slingshot and very quickly picked up a stone from the ground and he slung the sling slingshot over to, to Goliath and hit him right in the middle of the face and the big giant fell down and Phyllis, the Philistines were defeated. And so Saul started to get a little jealous of, um, of David and began to pursue him. David had to flee and run away for a while, but he had his friend uh, Jonathan who helped him out and protected him. In the year 1010, King Saul died in a battle. After King Saul's death, Ishbaal tried to assert himself to be as a, a, the king over Israel, but that only lasted about two years. In the year 1008, David defeated Ishbaal and David became the actual king of Israel. David reigned in Israel for 38 years until the year 970 BCE. Very important things happened during that time. One thing was the capture of Jerusalem. Jerusalem at that point was still a city of the Jebusites. It was called Jebu at the time. And it was so fortified that even though all the uh, Israelites had settled everywhere else, this city of the Jebusites had not been taken. David was, was able to capture the city of Jerusalem and made it his um, capital. After capturing Jerusalem, David also had plans to build a temple, a real temple for Yahweh in Jerusalem. David said, how could it be that he was living in this beautiful palace that he had built in Jerusalem and that God would still dwell in a tent? The kingdom of Israel was at its largest extension at the time of David. And everyone remembers this as the most ideal and most wonderful time of Israel. It is, it is what Jewish people even today yearn for to have the kingdom of David back. It was certainly the expectation during the time of Jesus that the, the kingdom of David would be reestablished. But there was one issue. You may know the story of Bathsheba, uh, the wife of Uriah, whom he stole from his uh, captain Uriah, and it becomes a great sin. When the prophet Nathan pro uh, confronts him, David sees his sin and, and repents. But Nathan said that he shall live and that his kingdom will continue with his son Solomon, uh, which happened when Solomon took over in the year 970 BCE, but that the kingdom after that would fall apart. But before that happened, Solomon was able to build that temple that David had already envisioned. He brought the idea of the tent of meeting and instead of making it a tent, made it a really beautiful, beautiful building, a permanent place in which um, the Ark of the Covenant now would be housed. You may want to stop here and watch that video on the Temple of Solomon. With the building of the temple, what was also solidified was the whole practice of sacrificing things, sacrificing animals. It goes back to the book of Leviticus where you have all these different prescriptions as to what you have to make sacrifices for. There would be thank offerings, there would be um, offerings for forgiveness, they, they sacrificed animals, they sacrificed grain. There was a whole thing about all the things that had to be sacrificed and the Levites became the priests at the temple. After Solomon's death in the year 931 BCE, two of his sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, thought about who is going to be the next king. This ended up in a division of the kingdom. Most of the tribes in the north separated off from the, the southern tribes. From the year 930 BCE on, you no longer have the unified kingdom of Israel, but you have Israel in the north, and Judah in the south. Judah also had Jerusalem in, as its capital. The northern kingdom, Israel, lasted for about 150 years. There were 20 kings during that time. It is said that during this time, the kings were unfaithful to God. It was during this time where we hear the story of King Ahab that was confronted by Elijah. Um, King Ahab had married a non-Israelite woman, Jezebel, 
who was worshiping uh, the, king, the god of Baal. One day, Elijah confronted the priests of Baal and, uh, and came out victorious against Baal and reestablished Yahweh as the god. But Jezebel was upset with him and so Elijah had to flee. During that time, we also hear about other prophets like Jonah. He didn't want to go. He was called by God to go up to Nineveh, um, which was an Assyrian city, and tell them that they should repent. You need to imagine this. Uh, Nineveh was the capital of a huge empire that was threatening Israel. And so he was afraid, and instead of going to Nineveh, he tried to escape. He tried to get away from Yahweh by going to the ocean instead and going on the ship and ended up in a big storm and had all the people on, the, on board the ship be afraid in that storm and, and finding out why they're coming into the storm. And finally, Jonah said, maybe it's because I was trying to run away from Yahweh. And so they're throwing him overboard and a big fish picks him up and brings him back to the shore and spits him out. And then God renews his command to go to Nineveh and to preach to the people in Nineveh. We also have other prophets like Amos and Hosea who are warning the people to worship God. But if you want to know why Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh, well, the Assyrian Empire had become so strong that they came into the territory of Israel and totally destroyed it and took away all the people in the Northern Kingdom. Historically speaking, that is pretty much the end of what we know of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted more than twice as long as Israel. That lasted 344 years. It also had 20 kings during that time period. Uh, so you can see that the kings there lasted a lot longer than they did in Israel. But they too were plagued by uh, periods where the kings were not faithful to God, where they worshipped other gods. Uh, Henotheism was still in full swing and the, and the kings were taking on the local canonized gods like, um, like Astarte and Baal. And so you have other prophets preaching to the kings of Judah, the Micah and Isaiah, the most famous ones, and then Jeremiah also, and Joel, and Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. They preach to the people of Israel that they need to be faithful to, to Yahweh and not to these other Canaanite gods and that God would punish them if, this, if they would not repent. But the people, especially in Jerusalem, believed that they had the temple there and the Ark of the Covenant was right there in the temple and that God would always protect Jerusalem. Nothing could happen to them. That idea came to a crashing end in the year 587 BCE. At that point, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II came into, into Jerusalem, besieged Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple that Solomon had built, destroyed the city, and took into exile uh, the leading people from Jerusalem into Babylon. Sitting in exile in Babylon, the people really got into a faith crisis. According to their previous beliefs, they would now have to start worshiping the gods of Babylon. But there were new prophets during that time that uh, tried to interpret the, the faith of the people. They said that this was God's punishment because the people had been unfaithful to Yahweh and that they would not listen any other way but to, through this destruction but that they should hang in there and wait there because eventually God will rescue them. Here the, the, the prophet spoke a word of hope while before they were speaking about judgment, now they're speaking a word of hope. The second part of the book of Isaiah talks about that kind of hope. And Ezekiel, who talks about the, a field full of bones, of dry bones, and the spirit is asking, oh Ezekiel, do you think that these bones can live? and there comes a rattling and all the bones come together and a new, li new life comes into the people. We have Daniel who talks about the fiery oven where Nebuchadnezzar is throwing Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego because he is refusing to bow down to the gods of the Babylonians. After 50 years of being in exile in Babylon, help did come by in the form of, of King Cyrus the Great of Persia 
the, the Persian Empire came in and defeated Babylon and deposed of Nebuchadnezzar. Now remember, what religion did the Persians practice? You're right, Zoroastrianism. And King Cyrus was kind to the, to the captives that were sitting in Babylon. He allowed them to go home, to rebuild Jerusalem. Cyrus even helped them to start rebuilding their temple. He said, I will even give you money, I will give you resources. You can rebuild your temple in Jerusalem. This was like a great gift to the exiles in Babylon that they could return. And so it is no, no wonder that they started to incorporate some of the beliefs of Zoroastrianism into the Jewish faith. One of the most important ideas is that there is only one God, that the other gods, the gods of the Babylonians don't really exist, and that Baal and Astarte and all these other gods don't really exist, but that the God that the Zoroastrians have identified as Ahura Mazda, that that is the same God that the Israelites had already worshipped as Yahweh. And so from now on, uh, Israel becomes fully monotheistic. They also get new ideas about resurrection. Up to that point, Jewish people did not believe in any kind of resurrection or afterlife. But now came the new idea that, that there would be a soul that would be living, continuing to live afterwards. And as you have an afterlife coming, uh, evolving within Jewish faith, you also get the concepts of a heaven or a hell, where you would end up, whether depending on how you lived your life. If you lived it well, you go to heaven. If you lived it not so well, you end up in hell. It also has the emergence of a figure of Satan. All these things had never been mentioned before in Jewish uh, writings, but from now on, you will see these concepts come up in Jewish uh, literature. Ezra was the priest at the temple, and Nehemiah became one of the kings in, in Israel. Of course, now the kings weren't totally free. They were still under the uh, guidance of the Persian Empire, but they had autonomy, and they had a benevolent empire watching over them. During that time, you have prophets like Haggai and uh, Zechariah and Malachi that preached to the people during this period. Eventually, in 332 BCE, Alexander the Great came in and made an end to the Persian Empire. At this point, life became more difficult again for the Jewish people. Alexander the Great brought Greek culture into the Middle East. And after the Alexander the Great died, the Eleusid Empire, also Greek, um, established itself from the year 312 to 63 BCE. Eventually, they desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. The Greeks put a big statue of uh, Zeus right in the middle of the temple. They took away all of the uh, temple vessels, and it was a horrible period for the Jewish people during that time. Between the years of 167 to 161 BCE, there was a, uh, the so-called Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabeans, a Jewish group, uh, revolted against the occupation and eventually were able to re-establish themselves and rededicate the temple in Jerusalem. It's here where the holiday of Hanukkah comes from because of the rededication. gather to light a branched candelabra called a menorah. For eight nights, they celebrate their families and celebrate their faith. The holiday is called Hanukkah, also known as the Festival of Lights. In the year 63 BCE, the Romans came in, kicked out the Greeks and established Roman rule in, in Israel. The Romans installed Herod the Great King Herod reigned in Judea from the year 40 BCE to the year 4 CE. We know him from the Christmas story that King Herod was there when Jesus was born. We hear much about the oppression of Israel during the time of Jesus by the Romans. There was a great hope that there will be a new Messiah, a newly anointed king of Israel who would come, who would liberate the people of Israel again, like, like God had done in the Exodus when he delivered the people from Egypt, like God had done when they were sitting in Babylon 
um, and King Cyrus uh, delivered them back into their land. And so the Jewish people were hoping for a new Messiah, a new king um, to come and to kick out the Romans so that Israel could be established once again as a full kingdom the way it was under King David. A lot of people came up in Israel during that time claiming that they were a messiah, but that was a battle cry for Romans, that that would be treason against the Roman Empire, because that would be a new king, a king that would kick out the Romans. The Romans knew how to handle that. Anyone who was accused of being a messiah or a king of Israel would be crucified. And so many, many people uh, suffered the, the punishment of crucifixion along the roads to the outside of Jerusalem. This led all the way to the year 66 when there was a full war breaking out against uh, the Roman Empire. The Romans besieged Jerusalem and eventually came into Jerusalem, destroyed the temple that was built under Cyrus and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Many Jewish people escaped at that time, uh, tried to go someplace where they would be safe. With the destruction of the temple, the temple cult was over. There was no place to sacrifice anymore. One important center of Jewish practice ended with this, and the religion had to figure out how to, to reorient itself. It is from this moment on that we find the distinctiveness of Judaism the way we might know it today. And here ends our second lesson in Judaism. Um, next time we continue with what happens after the people have been dispersed from Jerusalem and after there was no temple anymore. And how did this develop for the Judaism we know today?